Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arianna, and today I'm going to give you this uh, lecture about young generations, ethnonational identities, and clientelism in the cases of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Macedonia. Uh, before starting with uh, uh, the presentation, I would like to say that I'm very sorry that we cannot be together today and that um, you have to listen and see this uh, uh, video um, from your home, probably. Uh, in any case, I hope it will be interesting for you and I'm going to share with you my PowerPoint presentation so that you can, even though we cannot interact together, you at least can uh, see the slides and maybe uh, that is uh, more useful for you. Uh, before starting, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit myself, who I am and what I do. Uh, at the moment, I am a postdoc researcher at URAC uh, in Bolzano, and I'm working on a project uh, which is a comparison between the consociational uh, democracies of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and South Tyrol. Generally, I am uh, dealing with post-conflict societies, multi-ethnic societies, uh, and uh, very often based on uh, power sharing, so consociational mechanism. I've been working uh, in uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Macedonia, where I performed also my uh, PhD fieldwork. Um, and I've also been working on nationalism and ethnic politics uh, very much, and also now in uh, about uh, state capture and clientelism. Um, the uh, presentation I'm going to give you today is indeed related to some empirical data I've been gathering uh, through semi-structured interviews during my stays in Bosnia and Macedonia. I've been living in the Balkans in basically the last six, seven years. Um, and I got my PhD in sociology and methodology two years ago from the University of Milano and the Graduate School for Social and Political Sciences. Um, so I would say that now we can um, begin with this presentation and I will share with you my screen. So just wait a little second. Okay, I believe you can now see the screen. Okay, so Okay, I believe it's set up and you can see it. So, um, just a little bit of uh, introduction. Um, this is the uh, outline of what I'm going to talk to you today. So, the presentation is basically divided in two parts. The first one is not going to be theoretical, so I hope it won't be too, too boring. Uh, the first part is related to the institutional, political and economic situation of Bosnia and Macedonia. So, I will give you a little bit of overview and introduction about the historical, also uh, from an historical perspective of the um, situation in Bosnia and Macedonia. Then I will introduce you the concepts and uh, what, what it is actually state capture and clientelism, what is clientelistic relations. And then uh, the second part of the speech will be uh, grounded on the empirical material that I've been collecting in Bosnia and Macedonia. I will give you uh, a little bit of a hint about the methodology I've been using, the kind of inter in, in interviews I've been uh, performing. And then we will reflect about the case studies and also beyond the case studies, trying to understand, I mean, uh, the usefulness of uh, deepening this kind of topic. So, uh, institutionally speaking, um, Bosnia and Macedonia, uh, as you know, were federal units uh, of the Socialist Federation of Yugoslavia. Um, they were both multi-ethnic federations. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina was composed by three major ethnic groups, and the major ethnic marker between these three groups was their religious origins. Even though during Yugoslavia, ethnic identities were uh, something more related to the private sphere and they were not public and they were not politicized. 
In Bosnia also there was no uh, numerical majority, basically the three major groups uh, were coexisting together and there was no uh, majority above 50%. Different was the case of Macedonia. In Macedonia, we have always been, uh, there has always been a numerical majority, uh, and ethnic Macedonians have always been um, around 75% of the population, a little bit more before. And the Albanians, are, which are the second largest group, are supposed to be around 25% of the population. Uh, even if also in this case, the, uh, one of the ethnic marker between making the difference between the two groups is uh, um, a religion. The major distinguishing feature between Macedonians and Albanians has always been um, their language. So basically uh, the um, Macedonians, they generally, uh, most of times they do not speak uh, Albanian language, while the Albanians, they do speak. Uh, also the Macedonian language. Um, both republics, Macedonia and Bosnia, have been part of Yugoslavia until the 90s, uh, and 1990 there have been the first multi-party uh, elections, and after that, as you know, there has been the collapse of Yugoslavia. Bosnia-Herzegovina went through a terrible conflict which lasted almost five years from 92 till the end of 95 and it was uh, ended with the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement which also contained the uh, new domestic constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, Macedonia instead was the only uh, federal unit leaving Yugoslavia without going through any uh, war. However, uh, some tensions escalated in a 2001 short conflict, uh, short conflict which lasted about six, uh, six months and in 2001. And also in this case, the war was um, ended with the intervention of the internationals and with the signing of the uh, Ohrid Framework Agreement. Uh, in both cases, uh, uh, the uh, peace agreement um, put an end to the violence, uh, to the conflict, and set up the new state uh, according to ethnic power sharing mechanism. So institutionally speaking, we have that both um, Bosnia and Macedonia are based on consociational democracy, which, uh, which is basically post, uh, power sharing, ethnic power sharing. Um, and power sharing is, uh, uh, I will not go into details, but we need to know and to mention that power sharing is grounded on four major principles, which are, which are uh, the uh, setup of a grand coalition government between the repre political representatives of the major societal segments, uh, which are basically the major ethnic groups. These also enjoy a segmental autonomy uh, in different fields. They are also proportionally and equally represented in the state institutions, and they also have veto rights. Uh, for um, different in different subjects in different fields. Uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina, there are basically three major uh, ethnic groups, and they have been elevated, and they are basically the constituent peoples of the state, together with others, which is a catch-all category. In Macedonia, is that there are two major ethnic groups, as I said, Macedonians and Albanians, and basically with the um, implementation of uh, power sharing, uh, these two, uh, the state has become a de facto binational state. So uh, clearly this kind of uh, institutional setup has given a very, um, a, a, a rather clear salience to the ethnic and collective identities of the major uh, groups. And uh, uh, this has also influenced and shaped basically the kind of political scenarios and political spectrum that we have in both Bosnia and Macedonia. In fact, the major political parties in both countries have been building their identity, ordain electoral support and consent upon ethnic and collective identities. And the power sharing mechanism 
mechanism indeed uh, and to promote a fragmented, a fragmented uh, understanding of the larger state. So Bosnia, Herzegovina and Macedonia are not really conceived uh, and not really considered to be the state of all the groups, but there is like a very fragmented understanding uh, of the state and also have been um, promoting um, a sort of um, not promoting the legitimized basically the uh, misusing of this uh, mechanism ethnic uh, power sharing mechanism by the hands of political elites um, as tools for dividing, as tools for the uh, ethnopolitical way of ruling, so basically instruments of ethnic politics. Uh, as I said, this has also been influencing the kind of political scenario that we have in both countries. Uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, ever since the first multi-party elections, uh, uh, of uh, which where the one of 1990, the major political parties are ethnic political parties, and we also have very weak civic alternatives. So even when uh, civic political parties, which are multi-ethnic and more inclusive civic political parties, they try to compete uh, during elections with these uh, uh, ethno-nationalist political parties, they generally they do not get uh, a wider electoral support, so they remain very weak. And the same goes for Macedonia. Macedonia has basically uh, also, yeah, ethnic political parties, uh, Macedonians and Albanians. And even though uh, there has been this uh, colorful revolution uh, in 2015, which was against corruption and clientelism, and, this, uh, and there was this wiretapping scandal, um, also in this case, the civic uh, and multi-ethnic alternatives they didn't really uh, reach uh, a wider support, a wider consensus of the population, and they do not really exist. So in both uh, cases, uh, also from a political perspective, ethnic identities uh, uh, still retain very uh, importance and they do shape basically the uh, tailor the political scenario of both countries. Then there is another factor we must take into consideration in this analysis, even though it's, uh, it's not really uh, connected to ethnicity, uh, or at least directly, mm -hmm. and this is uh, economic. Uh, economic conditions in Bosnia and Macedonia have always been uh, rather poor. I mean, both the Republic, have, uh, even during the Yugoslavia and the, the Yugoslav era, uh, were among the poorest republics, uh, together with uh, Kosovo and to an extent also Montenegro. And uh, clearly enough, the economic situation got worse uh, in the 90s, and especially with the transition and in Bosnia with the war. Um, nowadays, we have indeed that uh, both countries are still going through uh, economic uh, deficiencies, economic crises. There are very high levels of unemployment, especially among the younger population. And there is uh, the, the phenomenon called uh, brain drain, as you might know. So basically the young people, when they can, they very often, they do go abroad in Western Europe. They try to have better living condition and working condition somewhere else basically. And uh, uh, also this uh, um, situation uh, of uh, economic condition and poor economic conditions and economic crisis allowed for the inflow of foreign capitals, which in a way also allowed the state to become rentier states. So depending, uh, they do depend on foreign capitals. And these, uh, the economic, the political, and institutional one, are basically the uh, macro uh, uh, basis and the macro foundation also of state capture in a way. So what is state capture? Uh, state capture by definition is a de facto takeover of entire state or public institutions typically by an elite cartel of politicians and business oligarchs, which are manipulating policy formation and even shaping the emerging rules of the game on their own very substantial advantage. 
State capture is therefore the systematic high-level corruption that establishes a hidden political regime at odds with the constitutional purpose of state institutions. It goes that with this definition, um, it's rather clear that uh, the political elite has a very uh, clear responsibility in uh, capturing the state institutions. However, the political elite, especially when it is entrenched in a democratic institution and is using the tools of the democracy, like in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, because we have this uh, consociational model of democracy, which is power sharing, also needs the support and the legitimacy of the population. So very often the political elite is establishing clientelistic and informal dynamics of interactions with the uh, masses, with the voters. So what is clientelism? Clientelism is an informal relationship between two actors enjoying asymmetrical socioeconomic power. There is therefore one actor, which is the most powerful and it's called the patron, which is controlling the kind of resources the more subordinate actor, which is the client, pursues but cannot enjoy otherwise. So the client, which are basically the masses, the voters, they do need the help and the mediation very often of a patron, which is a political party or a politician or a powerful man, business, businessmen or business elites sometimes uh, controlling institutions and resources. These resources are very often economic resources, financial resources, but also uh, job positions. And this is very much the case of Bosnia and Macedonia. And here we are talking about position, job positions in the public uh, institutions of the state, public bodies, and so on. So, the clientelistic one is a system that establishes a relation of domination and exploitation that perpetuates the lock and power of resource, resourceful politi political leaders, basically, almost, and hypothetically, forever. But let's see it more closely. In uh, the cases of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia, but overall in the former Yugoslav region and in the former socialist and former communist republics and countries, the clientelism has been considered like an understandable response to the large scale multiple transition the whole region had to go through in the 90s. So it was something like an unexpected response. And, um, to an extent, inevitable response to this multiple transition. And when I say multiple transition, I mean that these countries had to go through an ideological transition uh, from socialism uh, or communism to uh, democracy, political transition from mono to multi-ethnic party system, and also economic transition transiting to a uh, uh, capitalist market economy. Um, also, uh, informal um, relations uh, between politicians and uh, the, the masses and the people were already rooted in the political culture of the area. For example, the practice of favor and gifts uh, were rather common in the whole region. And also, uh, this uh, benevolent, in a way, benevolent attitude uh, of understanding clientelistic relations, informal uh, politics between politicians and the masses, uh, also um, justified the international's uh, massive presence and the inflow of foreign money uh, into the whole region because the region was seen as um, in need of a therapeutic intervention and help from the internationals from abroad and also these clearly enough uh, de empowered the domestic political elite uh, in a way uh, favoring uh, also state capture. So, 
uh, this um, overview is giving you a hint of uh, how institutional, political, economic, and also uh, historically grounded factors basically um, are setting up the foundations uh, for capturing the state for the political elite, which are ethnic political elite and very often also uh, nationalist and very often also business oriented political elite have been indeed sizing the institutions and also controlling uh, the institutions and the resources of the states, in this case of Bosnia and Macedonia. Uh, clearly, in the cases of Bosnia and Macedonia, especially in the case of Bosnia, the war and the war dynamics favored the enrichment of war profiteers and the post-war political elite also emulated the control over state resources. And in Macedonia, also in the 90s, we have this privatization process, which was rather untransparent and unlawful, and they were basically favoring the uh, people very tied and close to the ruling political elite. So these, uh, the, these uh, kind of political elites plus the post-conflict imp implementation of ethnic power sharing also favored this state sharing, which is basically state capture. And the ethnic mechanism of resources redistribution, basically uh, through uh, the principles of power sharing, we have seen at the beginning of this presentation, basically uh, proportional representation of the groups and um, have been basically misused by the ethnic uh, political parties becoming prime tools of state capture and uh, tools of ethno-clientelism. And uh, therefore the ethnic identity, the collective identity has become a catalyst uh, facilitating the individual's membership into the corresponding ethnic group and therefore the corresponding ethnic political party and therefore corresponding ethno-clientelistic network. So, with this uh, in mind, we can now proceed to the second part of my presentation, which is the one uh, related to the, um, to the data, empirical data I've been collecting uh, in Bosnia and Macedonia. Uh, the data I've been collecting are based on semi-structured interviews, uh, basically conversation I've been conducting with young adults aged between 25 and 30 years old in Sarajevo and Skopje in the years 2016 and 17 mainly. I, I choose this generational cohort because they were uh, this generation born in between the end of an era, the end of the Yugoslav era, and the beginning of the post-Yugoslav era. And also because uh, they are young citizens, but they are also old enough to have concerns such as uh, family, workplace, uh, future, politics, uh, work, and so on. The uh, questions uh, driving my interviews and driving my research were uh, related to uh, and devoted to understand, better understand how do young uh, adults, young citizens uh, uh, behave in these ethnically divided societies? How do they interact with ethnically connoted institutions and political parties? And what meanings and functions do they attribute to their ethnic identities? More in detail, I wanted to see how, when and why uh, they do get involved into informal or clientelistic dynamics with the political parties, with the ruling elite, and how do they contribute, uh, willing or not, to situations of state capture. So, the findings of my uh, of my research can be uh, summarized in three points. The first point is related to the functions uh, and the meanings of the ethnic and collective identities, uh, which are 
which can be summarized once again in two words, which are opportunism and, oppor and pragmatism. So um, from this young adult's perspective, ethnonational identities are very much uh, not related to uh, ideology and um, are uh, considered something are considered something um, that is composing their multiple identities so in their perspective very often uh, ethnic identity is just one uh, aspect of their uh, of, of who they are defining of who they are nevertheless are very much related to um, and very much described as tools or skills that can be mobilized uh, in this kind of ethnically divided societies uh, uh, and they have been described as proxy uh, instrumentally mobilized to enter the uh, system and access rights and benefits especially job position or financial resources or economic resources which are redistributed according to ethnic uh, criteria ethnic mechanism of resources redistribution and by the ends of ethnic political parties which are indeed uh, entrenched in these institutions and controlling these resources so, so for them um, ethnic identity ethnic identity identities are mobilized for pragmatic and opportunistic uh, uh, motivations. The second um, major point is related to awareness. So these young adults are completely aware about how their uh, societies are functioning and the fact that their societies are very often functioning according to informal relations between uh, the parties and the masses they do perfectly know uh, about the uh, clientelism and the normalization of uh, clientelistic dynamic uh, dynamics between the parties and the masses and they uh, indeed described clientelism as something which is normal that might ha uh, happen to anyone and something that is very much rooted in the country's culture this awareness and also the normalization and the um, the fact that these kind of practices practices have become normal and habitual made these young adults very skeptical uh, about the fact that the system will ever change in a better way. The system has indeed been portrayed at, uh, as something which is rotten inside and uh, has always been like this, it's just getting worse and will not get better in the future. So these uh, young adults very often they do blame the system and the political elite which are um, perceived as coercive, leaving people no alternative. And this kind of rhetoric is leading to uh, the third point, which is involvement. This tendency to uh, frame state capture and clientelism uh, as uh, um, um, in terms of fatality, coercion, as something that might happen to anybody. Uh, therefore, this blaming the systems and the politicians uh, is also, and on the opposite side, uh, favoring this attitude of uh, justification of the masses. So the masses very often, and they're being involved into clientelistic dynamics, um, is very often uh, portrayed as uh, um, uh, something unavoidable, that people are left with uh, no other alternative. So uh, the masses are very often pitied and justified and their engagement into these informal and illegal networks is very often justified in the light of the uh, system uh, coercion. And on this purpose, I would like to suggest you the reading of this book, The System Made Me Do It by Raz Karklings. Uh, which is very uh, very interesting analysis of uh, uh, corruption in the uh, former uh, communist societies. So the consequences of basically these three uh, major points are that 
on the one side, people uh, by justifying, uh, by blaming the elite and the system while justifying and beating the masses, they also have developed this uh, uh, increased tolerance for dishonest behavior and this increased permissiveness in a way um, of uh, people engagement into clientelistic dynamics. So basically those who get involved into uh, informal and clientelistic networks with the political elites or with the politicians were generally commiserated, justified, not really condemned, but pitied uh, in the light of the system, system's coercive potential. And uh, one of the most common answers, for example, was, you know, people need money, they need to survive. So they, they must, they have to get involved into this kind of relations. On the other side, this kind of dynamics is also uh, fueling this uh, corruption spiral, which is also preventing changes, uh, social and political changes. Uh, and uh, um, it's basically laying coherence to the status quo, not altering the equilibrium. So although uh, these young adults, they are aware of the consequences, they know that by getting involved into clientelistic dynamics, they are uh, basically laying coherence and giving power to this kind of uh, ethnopolitical elite, and, and they are also perpetuating the situation of this state capture and clientelism, they go along with this uh, status quo, not challenging this kind of equilibrium, they keep on voting for the same parties, even though they are blamed to size the state institutions. And this, they do it because this is how it works. So basically there is uh, the expectation that this, this, the, the system is going to be like this. And the expectation that everybody does it is basically generating coherence. So from a very rational perspective, from a game theoretical perspective even, there is no incentive to defect. There is no incentive to behave in a different way. So basically more honestly. So just to uh, conclude this presentation that I believe is already rather, rather long, what we can uh, say. Uh, clearly, uh, this is the behavior featuring the majority of the population, but not the whole major the whole population. Clearly, there are people not involved into clientelistic dynamic. Clearly, there are people not voting for ethnic political elites, and also not the whole political elite. Not all the political parties are behaving and controlling uh, the state institutions, and they are not engaged or creating the conditions for clientelism and clientelistic dynamic. Clearly, I want to stress it out, there are uh, people behaving according to very honest uh, behavior and moral way of uh, uh, of acting in the society. Nevertheless, this is uh, the one of clientelism as the capture is a reality and uh, it is a phenomenon we must take into account in our analysis because it's becoming very, very um, dangerous as well. So concerning the conclusions, there are two major uh, conclusions. One, is related to people's behavior. Um, people's behaviors, as I said, goes in this direction. And it's very hard, therefore, to distinguish between those who are victims and those who are accomplices of this kind of dynamics and therefore state capture systems. So for a sizable portion of the population, the involvement into informal and clientelistic networks is really a survival strategy. So they are rather, uh, they might be considered victims of this kind of system. So for them, uh, there is really no other alternative. Let's think of maybe the most uh, disadvantaged strata, this, uh, disadvantaged uh, strata of the population, the poorest people or those living in the uh, rural areas, remote areas of the countries. So for them, um, these dynamics are really uh, 
a way to survive the ethnopolitical scaffolding. There is really no other alternative. So their behavior is based on the belief that anyone's well-being depends on their belonging to a certain network of redistribution of resources, which is channeled by their ethnic identity. So this is a conscious and pragmatic response to the scarcity of resources, services, and jobs. But on the other side, uh, as we, uh, we saw, um, there are also individuals which are justifying their dishonest behaviors and their engagement into these uh, patron-client relations behind statements such as, you know, everybody does it, this is how it is, uh, this is how the system is working, ah, but the political elite is bad, it's all corrupted, we cannot do but, uh, but get involved into these relations. So the fact that petty corruption and uh, clientelism have been normalized uh, is also very much uh, used as a sort of alibi, as a sort of excuse to decondemn their own um, dishonest behaviors and their um, behaving like a client, their engagement into clientelism. The second in and last uh, conclusion is related to, more, it's more general and it's related to the kind of system the, uh, these dynamics are uh, generating, consolidating and perpetuating as well. So uh, this system uh, are only apparently dysfunctional. Uh, on the opposite, they are very functional because they are reproducing an equilibrium. They are reproducing a, uh, a vicious circle, which has been also called the corruption spiral, uh, which is creating stability. So this stability is very much grounded on the system efficiency, actually. Uh, so this, uh, um, this permissiveness towards this daily act of clientelism, this everyday state capture is consolidating in people some expectations and also in the political party, the expectation that the masses will behave uh, as they are accustomed to behave. So this creates coherence and this uh, creates basically uh, incentives to uh, keep on behaving as anybody else is accustomed to behave. So no incentives to defect from a very rational perspective. So collective experiences and expectations prevent the majority of both the elites and the masses um, not to defect, altering the equilibrium. And this assures basically the system's functioning and the system stability. And this is the reason why, for example, these societies have been addressed in terms of stabilitocracies. Stabilitocracies are indeed societies which are stable, even though they are not really democratic or not really doing step forwards in the direction of democracy and rule of law. So, just to uh, conclude and to say um, a couple of few words, um, what I have been trying to uh, tell you today is related to certain dynamics, which are of course spe specific to Bosnia and Macedonia, but clearly enough, they can be enlarged and broadened to the, uh, not only to the whole region, the Balkans or uh, former Yugoslavia, and uh, uh, not only uh, the former socialist or communist region and the Central and Eastern European region, but this kind of dynamics are also very widespread in Western Europe in the consolidated democracies. So uh, these, um, this, uh, uh, even though we are used to call it state capture, uh, or we are used to say and talk about ethnopolitics, I mean, if we um, broaden our uh, point of view and our perspectives, indeed, we see that the same kind of dynamics are really featuring our. Uh, 
our uh, own realities, uh, also Italy, for example. So there is a, some sort of conceptual confusion. What sometimes we call state capture is not really different from what in other contexts we call corruption, nepotism, clientelism, or mafia. So I would suggest that, for example, we could and we should uh, increase uh, our comparative works, enlarging our perspective all along the democratic continuums, including Western and Eastern European countries as well, because we might find that actually there are very similar patterns of behavior and from both the um, masses uh, side and the political elite sides. So, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention so far and uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you find it uh, interesting also for your works, your future studies. And uh, I am at your total disposal for any questions or advice or comments or anything you need. You might uh, anytime uh, drop me an email. Uh, here you can see my email addresses. Uh, one is the, uh, the one from the institution where I work for. The other one is my personal account. You can drop me an email. Uh, anytime and I would be really help with really uh, happy to to help you uh, once again thank you for your attention and um, have a good afternoon bye